Hello to everyone in Japan and those of you following from home. My name is Remy van Trepp and I work at the Sony Computer Science Laboratories Paris. And today I would like to talk to you about how to scale up computational models of language emergence and evolution. The inspiration for this talk comes from a challenge that was posed by Marike Wunstrecht and her colleagues last year, who offered a complexity analysis to investigate whether these computational models of language evolution can scale to ecological scales. What that means is that current computational models typically have only a very small population of artificial language users, called agents, and only small languages consisting of a couple of words. While natural languages, they uh, have tens of thousands of words and they can have population sizes go up to millions of people. The conclusion of the study is very grim. They write that, at least in their current form, these uh, models of language evolution are computationally intractable. This means that if you want to scale up this model, you get into such a combinatorial explosion that even with the fastest computers ever, you would not be able to uh, compute or to, to model this phenomenon, which is uh, you know, putting a real wall against what is possible. So I want to argue, however, that uh, the title of this study is quite misleading because instead of uh, models of language evolution in general, they write actually about a specific kind of Bayesian iterated learning model. And in this kind of model, which is illustrated on the left, which is very well known in the community, you have typically an adult uh, tutor that produces language, and then you have a child learner who observes and has to try and learn the language. And then there is a turnover of the uh, generations. The child becomes the adult, and then a new child enters the population. And so we have an iteration of language transmission. Now, in this particular model, the language is always transmitted as if it was a unit, as if it's the basic unit of transmission. This has as a consequence that the learner has to explore the entire space of all possible languages. That means that even for a simple vocabulary of one-to-one -one mappings between words and references, reference, the space of uh, possible mappings consists of a combinatorial explosion of possibilities as we increase uh, the amount of reference, the amount of words. Their paper has a nice example to show that even a small scale-up already gives you headaches. So if you have a toy language consisting of only 50 words, 25 references to talk about, a learner would already have to entertain a hypothesis space of possible languages that is so huge that, you know, this number, I don't even know how it would be called. Uh, you would need a lifespan of the entire universe to calculate a solution, which makes it practically impossible to do this simulation. Moreover, uh, there is a claim in the paper that it's not clear that other models able to replicate uh, the kind of success that the iterated learning model has would not run into the same problem of, of intractability. And it's particularly with this claim that I want to contradict today. Not only is it possible to, uh, to escape this wall of intractability, there already exists a model called the language game paradigm, which uh, exists since the mid-90s that has already solved this problem. And the best way I can do is to demonstrate to you in real time that this uh, example that Hunsrecht and others mentioned that is already so difficult to calculate that you can just do it in real time with this uh, methodology. So what is the, the language game method? Is instead of having a transmission from an adult to a child learner, you have a population of language users that are all peers of each other, they can act as uh, the producer and the comprehender, they can switch roles, and they have to reach communicative success in local interactions which we call language games. And the simplest interaction is a naming game where they have to uh, draw the attention of the listener or the comprehender to an object uh, using a name for that object. What you see evolving here in real time is on the left, uh, in blue, the community of success between the agents, which means that they interact and understand each other. And in uh, yellow, you see whether they are converging on using the same names for the same objects. Uh, what this means is that because we have multiple agents, so there's 10 agents in this population, each agent can invent new words they will come up with different names for different objects 
and but just by communicating with each other and adapting themselves they will align in the end and they will uh, converge on the same vocabulary what you see here on the right is uh, the lexicon size so this is the number of uh, words that they invented in total uh, so this is the total amount of uh, you would say words that an agent is confronted with which goes up to almost 120 and uh, learned associations on average per agent is a little less so you have like 70 words that each agent has to learn for 25 objects and then in red is uh, how many words the agents are actively using so what you typically see in these experiments is that in the beginning there's an overshoot of what an agent has to learn but then they start converging as you see they're all made completely converged uh, and, and in only a matter of a couple of uh, thousands of interactions, these agents come to a conclusion. Okay, so while this experiment is running in the background, let me uh, discuss a little bit what's happening in the demonstration. So, uh, what you were seeing is that on average in this population of 10 artificial agents, there would be like 125 words competing to become the word, the name of one of these 25 objects. This means that the average hypothesis space for an agent is uh, even much bigger than the example, theoretical example on the patient learning on the left. Yet, it only takes like 600 interactions per agent to reach 100% communicative success. And it only reaches, uh, it only takes 800 time steps per agent, 800 interactions, 800 of these language games before they reach full consensus. Meaning that even though there's all of this uh, variation initially, they home in onto uh, a shared language. So let us check whether in the meantime the simulation is already finished. And indeed this is the case. So you see on the left that they have reached 100% cognitive success, about 2500 for a population of 10 agents. And a little bit later they also have uh, uh, consensus. This is the total number of words circulating in the population. This is the uh, learned associations on average per agent. And this is the active lexicon on average per agent. And this went well down, so they reached the ideal uh, lexicon size of 25 words for this particular uh, setting. Uh, what about scaling this thing? Well, this has already been done. Uh, this is an experiment that scaled up uh, the population size, actually. So they uh, scaled up to 100,000 agents uh, with this kind of uh, language game. And one of the remarkable findings was that actually the larger the system size, and system size in this case means larger population size, the larger the population size, the larger the language became, the faster the convergence rate went up. So you get a very sharp transition, which has this nice S-shaped form that we find in natural languages as well, towards uh, convention. So this is actually a good explanation of why natural languages actually scale so well, that it's possible that our populations can grow up to millions of language users and still we manage to share the same language. So why do these language games scale so well? Well, a couple of things. So first of all, the unit of transmission is not languages as a whole, but it's actually construction. So uh, there is, uh, for example, work by Bill Croft, the utterance-based theory of selection, is that language users never have to consider the entire learning space, but only what is relevant for that particular uh, interaction. And so what are the constructions that are needed for this particular interaction? That is what is being selected for. That is what's being transmitted, and this is why the learner never faces this ex combinatorial explosion in learning. And so this, we take inspiration from construction grammar. Secondly, agents only care about the constructions that are relevant to the locally situated interactions. So relevance theory, heuristic decision making, constructivist learning, all of these uh, theories, and you can see some references at the bottom of the screen, they are inspiring this kind of work and operationalizing in operationalizing these uh, computational uh, experiments. Again, the idea is instead of blindly searching the entire hypothesis space, agents will only look at what is relevant for them in their current interactions. 
If you want to learn more about uh, how the talking is experiment, this is this is like the naming game that I showed, but it, it scales up the language a little bit. This was actually one of the uh, biggest distributed systems still today in experiments with agents traveling from over the internet from Paris to Tokyo uh, to Brussels, where they would uh, be installed locally into a robotic head to observe objects in their environment and then play this naming game uh, with other agents. And so this showed how the experiment scaled up to tens of thousands of agents to tens of thousands of words. The final uh, reason why this, this works so well is, well, languages, they become conventional through self-organization and alignment. So we take a lot of inspiration from complex systems in that agents uh, uh, try to optimize their cognitive success. So when they observe a particular uh, construction or a word in a successful interaction, they will increase their confidence that this is something that they also could use when they communicate with others. And if everyone does the same kind of adaptation, just like uh, birds form a nice cloud or with, like ants form an ant path, spontaneously the population as a whole will converge on a single um, language or at least a communicative language that is sufficiently shared that they all can communicate with each other. So the conclusions uh, for today is that the study of Wunstrecht and her colleagues is important. I mean, this, you cannot argue with complexity analysis. It is, it is very sound in terms of methodology, but it makes one misleading and at least one false claim. So instead of looking at models of language evolution, the criticism is actually valid for only a particular kind of model, iterated Bayesian learning. And even there, even though I'm not an expert in iterated learning, I'm not sure that it's, it's completely correct for this model. But secondly, most importantly, there is already an, a model methodology that exists, the language game methodology, which is implemented in, uh, by my colleagues and myself in an open source software toolkit called Babel. Uh, that you can use for doing these experiments. And so language games, they have already been scaled and they scale so very well because of its cognitive foundation. So we look at construction grammar, relevance theory, heuristic decision-making, constructivist learning and complex systems and alignment. Uh, all of these things that you need to put into these models to make sure that they can scale to ecological scales. I do believe that iterated learning and language games are compatible models, so what I said today is not to say that one model is better than the other. I believe that the best of both worlds can be combined. And here I would like to thank you for your attention.